Hello and welcome to the Bird Talk Show. We've got a fantastic show lined up for today. We're going to be talking about that easy bird watching and why wouldn't we? Bird watching is so easy. You need just a few tips. I'm going to give those to you today and every day here on the Bird Talk Show. Those clips were all filmed in the Bird Garden at the Bird Garden 24-7 live feeding station. Uh, even the bird bath, the bluebird was jamming in at the end, that last little clip. I hope you enjoyed that. That guy is just up the hill in frame behind the bird feeding station. You can see that uh, on the 24-7 live bird feeding station stream right here at the Bird Garden channel. I know many of you have enjoyed watching those birds. They, they make your life better. Certainly an uplifting part of my day. I leave them playing in the living room all day. And I've got big screen live bird feeding action. And I enjoy it. I can't, I mean... Who would have thought, right, with, with so much good programming on TV these days, who would have imagined I'm using my big screen TV in the living room to watch a live bird feeding station? Well, I'll say this. Give it a whirl. Now, watch it for one minute. But put yourself on the clock. Give yourself 60 seconds. Now, there are busier times than others. The morning, it's always crowded. If you go, if you hover over the video screen, you'll see a little red line at the bottom. You can go to the right side of your screen and drag the little red dot back 12 hours. It's a DVR. So you can go back to that morning feeding rush and see lots of different birds. Now, typically all times during the day are active at some level. We do have a Cooper's Hawk in the area that Fortunately, hasn't taken anything from the feeder that I'm aware of. No feather pools, no visual evidence. So the feeding station gets slow uh, when those Cooper's hawks are around well, for good reason. And we're glad that it's slow at that time. Right now, if we clicked over, and we will, six of you watching, uh, stay tuned. We're going to go over to the live bird feeding station. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to be about it. We're going to show you the live birding feeding station, the live bird feeding station, and um, we'll just see. I was going to say right now, um, just coming out of their little noon siesta, probably a slow time as the show goes on, they'll start trickling back in. Uh, one bird, then two birds, then three or four at a time, several different species. So this uh, early afternoon being the slowest time uh, for any birding activity in my experience, uh, which by the way, uh, man, that just toggled a switch in my brain when I said experience. We're talking about the best bird food today. I'm going to show you what that is, in my opinion. But I want to qualify my opinion and tell you that um, it's an expert opinion based on experience. Now, you could read an article. and Let's don't say you because you, you are wonderful. Let's say someone out there could read an article and form an opinion and tell you about their opinion. I mean, it happens every day. You see it on YouTube all day long, but how much better is it when someone has an experience, a positive experience, and they say, this is my experience. I want to share it with you. Put it on your buffet of options. If it helps you, fantastic. If part of it helps you, take the part that you like, share it. There's plenty to go around. And then, you know, if you don't like it, don't spit on it. It may be what the next guy's looking for. Just Go on down the buffet till you find something you like. Um, so that, that's what I'm going to tell you about today's topic. Look back, apply that to last week's bird talk show topic, which was the best bird feeder. And understand it's, it's based on 50 years of experience of feeding birds. If you like it, fantastic. Now, here's, here's one thing that I'll say. If, if there's a weakness in, 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 merely having to choose the best. It can be definitely based on your situation. But um, the, a weakness is that the word best usually, usually, typically, isn't associated with cheapest. So there's cost involved, there's, but it's a value decision. If it works in your budget, you want the best value for your money. I'm, I'm guiding you in this direction. So we'll get to that, I promise. I've got the best food on my desk and I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you and I'm going to recommend it and I'm going to tell you why, but it's based on experience, not just an opinion. My opinion is based in factual experience. Therefore it's hard to sway me. It's hard to change my mind. I've already had the experience. doesn't mean I wouldn't try something else, look at something a different way, 
Um, I think science is flexible that way. Science is a big boy. Pardon the gender um, slang there, but science isn't offended, right? Scientists are easily offended in some cases, but science can measure something any way it wants to. Science is just the measurement of something and the storing of the measurement and the sharing. And then um, scientists are able to make deductive reasoning, maybe fill in the gaps sometime based on measurements, but science isn't offended. So I like to be flexible like Gumby and science. I've got the best bird. I know it's the best. 50 years of trying, I finally found it. Could there be a better mouse trap come along? Sure. And I don't want to miss it because I'm rigid in my dogma. See, that's different than fact. Dogma is not fact. And I don't want to be so deeply entrenched in my dogma that I miss the next best mousetrap. But today, today is March 2nd, 2022 here on the live stream. And if you're watching the replay, thank you very much. I don't know what day it is. And hopefully this is evergreen content. I'm going to upload it uh, as, as content for replay purposes. I'll be interacting with the chat for the people that are here at the live, but also the majority of the content will be so that we can leave this, uh, as, as a replay live stream for anyone who wants to drop in and see it. So thank you replay gang. If you're seeing this and we've already concluded the live stream. And if you're hearing the live stream, seven of you are welcome. And thank you very much. We'll be saying hellos in just a second, uh, a couple of matters of housekeeping here. I've rearranged the microphone here in the studio. Now you can see it on screen. So if someone would drop a note uh, in the chat regarding the audio visual situation, especially the audio, I'll take a peek at that in just a second. And I've also uh, need to mention that we uploaded a short, uh, a YouTube shorts video yesterday. It's the first time we've done that in months. Uh, there are plenty, there's a library full of bird garden shorts with hundreds of thousands of views because birds are awesome. And uh, so we, we uploaded a new short because we were gifted a piece of original music from our friend Myrtle Singh, a composer uh, and a YouTuber. And I linked in the video, we posted the full length video, which featured the entire song, two minutes. Uh, well, I'll show, I'll show it to you uh, coming up. I'll show you that video. And you, you'll know you can go back and check that on the Bird Garden YouTube channel anytime you want with the original score from Myrtle Singh. Thank you so much, Myrtle. His YouTube channel is listed uh, in the index cards on the video and in the video description. So that short happened. And I think we're going to upload another short. We did a one-minute short. We did a full song video, a one-minute short. And I think we're going to do a 15-second short because the footage is amazing. Just some red-winged blackbird males showing off. And you know, it's my favorite bird. <laughs> I don't know if you recognize this abstract work of art, but uh, I've loved that bird since childhood. So finally got some excellent footage on the bird feeding station. So probably we'll do a 15-second short as well, all featuring Myrtle Singh's music, and our red-winged blackbirds from the bird garden. So that'll give us a nice a nice catalog on that one clip from the live bird feeding station, a, a two minute plus full song experience with the blackbirds at the feeder, a one minute partial song, um, kind of a, a creative chopping clipping of that full video for the birds. And then we'll see what we can come up with for a 15 second video. I want to check in the chat here. Say hello. See if anyone has any difficulty with the AV. We got Joseph Stanley here. Hello. Hello. Canestio Valley Cichlids. Hello. Love you too, guy. Thanks for being here. Red Wing Blackbird for sure. Pileated Woodpecker. Nice shirt. We're going to talk about it. We're talking about the Pileated Woodpecker today a little bit. A little bit we are. All right. Uh, the Silver Crested Raxer last week. Yeah, baby. That's right. Yeah, it's coming on in. Yeah, it can't hide it. You know, it started down here and it's working its way up. Yeah, it's it's in the temples. Distinguished is, is the word we're using. But I'm letting my hair grow out. So I'm trying to distract you. No, you know, just don't pay attention to that old stuff. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. 
non-gray hair there in the back. A COVID cut. Wow. Just <laughs> got out of control. Hey, no, my hair has never been this long. Longest hair I've ever had in my life. Now, now I lived in the 70s, okay? Anywho, moving on. Uh, we've got Patrick Hardy saying hello, Rack. I want a few of your artworks. They'll be here in Houston, Texas. Hey, Patrick, congratulations. I donated that art to a charitable auction. I'm so glad to know that uh, they found a good home. I hope you enjoy it. I hope they bring you as much happiness uh, as they do me. I've got art on my desk. My wife has it in several of her little uh, mini museums through the house. Uh, if you haven't heard that story, I'll tell you. I paint uh, and I use the paintings to auction, raise some funds for the channel and so forth. But every time I finish a session or a painting, it's staged in an area. I'm drying the painting, right? I'm keeping it out of the way in an area that just happens to be out in the open. So my wife sees it and I go back to get the painting. It's either there and I can auction it, give it to an auction, sell it, whatever I want, or it's gone. <laughs> and when it's gone, that means my wife liked it and, um, and no one gets to own it, but my wife, I'm very, it works out. Everybody's happy, happy wife, happy life. I'm very, um, uh, just tickled, you know, that my wife likes my work well enough to keep it. So it, it's good. It's win-win. And so, yeah, you got some leftover art there. My wife picked over, but you know, I say that tongue in cheek because it's all in the eye of the beholder. Some of the works that I like the best, my wife not interested in. All right. And it's the same for every unique viewer. You get to have your own experience. I do abstract art. I don't over explain it. I'll tell you the inspiration for that painting was a red winged blackbird, but don't let that be a fence around your creativity. Enjoy it however you want to. So thank you very much for mentioning that. I'm happy to hear about that. Uh, OKC Cal says, I got that right. Well, it's good to have you in here. O o OKC Cal, great to have you, my friend from the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival, which is where I got the shirt, actually. The ABA had that at their booth over there, and I picked that up. I'm a fan of woodpeckers. If you watch the 24 seven live stream, you know, we got woodpeckers. We're so proud of our redheaded woodpeckers that stayed all year this year. Last year, they migrated away in the winter. This year we've identified seven different individuals that have stayed all winter at the feeder, including four adults. I have a video up of four adults at the feeding station at the same time. Pretty awesome. And I love, I love our woodpeckers. Uh, going on down the line here, 3G, what is going on? Welcome, loud and clear. Thank you very much for that. And, okay, you were back in Aransas last week. Okay. The OKC, we met down there looking at those um, whooping cranes in Corpus Christi, Texas, Charlie's Pastor. Um, and so did you see the whooping cranes again? OKC. I know we got great looks at them through my scope when we were out there during the Rio Grande Valley, um, birding festival. It's quite a treat, by the way, that birds endangered low numbers, extreme measures in progress right now, to try and keep that bird from going extinct. I uh, have also seen it in my home state, Tennessee, over here in the Eastern part of Tennessee, hanging out with some uh, sandhill cranes that come through in the thousands. Um, so, well, that's, that's interesting. That toggled another switch. Eight people watching now. Thank you guys for being here. If you haven't hit the like button, that makes me feel good. <laughs> it exercises the algorithm and, and lets the algorithm know. People are tuning in and they're hitting the thumbs up button. Wow, something's going on over there. So I appreciate it when you do that. Uh Yeah, Canestio. Patrick Hardy says that Canestio ship all your rack art, all your rack artwork to Texas. Yeah, there you go. Send it over. Canestio Valley, big collector. Yeah, and I see now. Canestio Valley Cichlid says I have a few of Rack's uh, artwork myself. Indeed, you do, sir. You're an excellent auction winner. Congratulations. And we, I have fun during the auctions, and I would describe Canestio Valley Cichlids as a heavyweight bidder. And uh, that you've been warned if you do an auction 
in the future. And we may, I may have to, you know, <laughs> but, but we did the last, uh, we did the last art auction and there were just so many moving parts, so much distraction, trying to get the show going, trying to uh, run a bird watching YouTube channel. And then the, then the art is great when it works and it's smooth like butter. It is so cool. Everyone wins, but when there's, when there's a few glitches and it just clouds your mind, you're like, I am not dealing with this. We're just going to put that to the side for a minute. I describe it as a juggler, you know, and, and when one of those items fall, they all fall. And um, I'm just not in a situation where I want everything to fall. Right. So I'm just going to be a little bit selective for now and keep the main thing, the main thing. And if we need to have a, uh, an art auction with, <laughs> we'll declare a state of emergency and, and raise some funds, but we're no, we're nowhere near there. So we'll, we'll see. I love sharing the art with you guys. And I do appreciate you guys bidding on the art, supporting the channel and enjoying the work that I'm able to creatively produce. All right, moving on. You've hit the like button. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. If you've not subscribed to the Bird Garden YouTube channel yet, please don't overlook that. Go ahead and sub up, hit the bell icon so you're notified uh, when we upload new material and content. I did um, I did use the community tab recently a couple of times. If you have hit that uh, bell icon, you'll also get notification when I use the community tab. I've made some new friends on YouTube and I'm sharing their content. It's pretty cool. And, uh, I don't want you to miss that. Okay. And as when appropriate, I'll definitely give them a shout out, uh, during the show. I don't know if, if everyone's aware of this or not, but my specialty is helping small YouTube channels reach their first thousand subscribers. And I've done it a number of times. As a matter of fact, this is not my first YouTube station, uh, station channel. Um, I have, multi-thousand subscriber YouTube channel. And then I started this channel from scratch and reached a thousand subscribers in less than a year. And I'll tell you, this was a special challenge because what I've learned about bird watchers and birders is they're not glued to the YouTube. They're in the field looking for birds and they're sharing uh, bird sightings, maybe on a specialty Facebook group, a hotline situation where they call each other a group. And they're not doing a lot of YouTube by and large, but birds are so cool. I'm able to use it as a, a tool to invite new bird watchers in. Some people are watching YouTube. And if I can make a beautiful thumbnail and present an opportunity where I can repeatedly say, this will make your life better and prove it and invite you to prove me wrong and show you how you can make your life better by bird watching, then, then we can grow a channel from scratch to a thousand subscribers in less than a year. So the birds win, I win as a creator, and you win as a consumer. Now, that's kind of the way all of that works. But then the way I'm able to help these small channels reach the first thousand subs is directing their passion and ability and desire to a, a really compatible, relationship with the algorithm, which decides who gets to see your video. Now you can invite all your family and friends, which is great. And you should, but basically you're going to have to get a video suggested by YouTube and it's going to have to perform well when it's suggested to be suggested again. So I'm able to share all of my experience there and help channel after channel after channel reach a thousand subs. If that's their goal, if you've got a channel, that's not your goal. That is totally cool too, man. But if you'd like help like that, uh, I've able, I've reproduced that many times and I really enjoy doing it. So based on that experience, the factual experience, I'm able to share and see results in other people's lives and channels. Also, I think it's the same when I declare the best bird feeder the best bird food. It's factual. If you'll do it this way, you'll probably have similar success. Okay. Now, one thing about birds is they change. You get across the hundredth meridian going West over Texas and the birds change. Now, by and large, I was in Texas. You can watch some of those Rio Grande uh, birding festival videos and you'll see it at the feeding stations that I recorded. You're going to see very similar techniques to what I'm going to describe today. And so the caveats might be 
uh, high elevation rainforest, low elevation deserts, uh, seabirds. Um, yeah, this this best food that I'm telling you about. <laughs> I'm going to be really surprised if I ever attract a puffin to my feeding station, right? Now, that that sounds ridiculous. But if if you're a bird watcher, you know puffins, they don't visit bird feeding stations. They're a coastal bird. And I, I just say that to make the point that it is definitely the best bird food for my situation and probably will work very well for your situation. I can, If you ask me what's the best bird feed, I can only share my experience. I can't very well share someone else's unless then I'm just a, a talking head with an opinion because I read an article. Um, and if that's all you've got, that's all you have access to, you kind of got to go with that too. Well, he said, she said, okay, well, let's take that with a grain of salt. Don't bet the farm on it and, and give that a whirl. But we have been meeting and greeting here, eight people present now. Thank you guys so much for for showing up. I really appreciate having you here. We've been going for 23 minutes now and you still don't know what the best food is. Thank you for hanging in there. We're going to get right to it. Um, I got it right here. The best bird food is right here. All right. Now this is not sponsored. This is not supposed to be an advertisement for any company. This is just it's giving you an example, okay? This is a pillar feeder. That's not loose seeds. Some some seeds are loose. They've kind of broke off of the cylinder, all right? And if you look carefully, you can see there's a hole right through the center of that thing, all right? That right in there. It goes all the way through, all right? So it's a cylinder, a pillar feeder, right? Seeds held together by gelatin. And you can see a variety of seeds and some fruit. All right. And there's no holes. No holes on the seeds. Right. All right. That's a lot. That's a lot to digest. There's a lot to digest there. It's a pillar feeder. The seeds are held together with gelatin. Many companies make these. You can find them at your big box store, your local bird feeding store. I've even seen videos where you can make them yourself. But the pillar feeder holds the seed together. It's not windblown. When a morning dove comes in and flaps its big, strong wings, doesn't blow seed all over the place. Um, no holes. Birds don't have to work at getting the seed out of the hole. They do have to work at plucking it from that, that gelatin that fixes everything together. And that holds them at the feeder for at least a few seconds longer. You get a better look at them at the feeder. Um, by the way, BT dubs last week, we talked about the best bird feeder uh, and it's not going to work well with this shirt compatible colors. So this was it, right? It's just like a stalk and a base, a couple of perches, and metal head, metal hook, and then you see the slot that the head fits in there. So it slides in, and there's your best feeder. All right, and this is the best bird food. It goes right on there. And then the dome keeps the water and the, the snow out keeps the birds from pooping on it mostly. And then you do have, you know, evidence of birds being at the feeder on top of that dome. So you got, you got no holes. All right. We're going to talk about that. No holes. It's held together by gelatin. So it doesn't blow all over. Doves don't knock it off. And the birds stay at the feeder a little bit longer. The free expert advice right here on the bird garden channel. I just want to make your life better. Give me a minute. I'll make your life better. Also, um, the, the expense, I'm gonna, again, the weakness is the expense. Can you buy cheaper food? Yes, every day, bro, anywhere you look. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the cheapest bird food. If you shop it and you find the pre-made gelatin food pillar, it's going to seem expensive compared to loose seed, especially with the hull on it. Okay, it's a value proposition. You decide 
if it's worth it for you. It is for me. Now, the no, no holes. But where do the holes go? The birds don't eat the holes. They don't ingest the holes. They pick the seed out and they leave the holes. The holes get knocked on the ground. They accumulate. They hold moisture so they could grow mold and mildew. You don't want that around your feeding station or your dog, you know, or the other mammals that may come into the yard. Fish, if you got a 5,000-gallon koi pond with a 26-foot water fall, you don't want that stuff getting mold on it and then blowing into the, the koi pond. Check out Pond Life YouTube channel if you want to know more about that. Some sweet underwater slow motion footage of koi. Mm, love my koi. Anyway, just off screen, if you go to the live feeding station, the koi pond is just off screen to the left. And I uh, don't want the empty seed holes getting in there. I don't want it uh, growing mold and mildew. I don't want it infecting animals, especially birds, or attracting rodents. Okay? So when I eliminate all of those problems by using a holeless seed to begin with, my bird feeding life is better and yours will be too. Is it necessary? No. Can you have success with the less expensive food? Absolutely. Yes. You can. And I have for years, for years. And that brings me to an interesting point. The way I feel about uh, the best bird food today is not the way I have always felt about the best bird food. It's a process. And I've been processing for 50 years. And there were there was a very long period of time that I operated bird feeding stations with loose black oil sunflower seeds only. And always, eh, I'm, I'm just bragging. I always thought that I had the best bird feeding station in the neighborhood the most birds in my yard probably had more to do with maintenance and care and love and watching it. And if you don't do those things, you, you can put a bird feeder out it runs out of seeds and you notice it weeks later. Oh, I got to get some seeds in that thing. So, uh, uh, and that's another thing with this pillar feeder. It's pretty easy, um, to tell, when, when you need a new pillar, right? Uh, just at a glance. It's not one of those hopper feeders you have to go up to and look into or whatever. And if you got a 24 seven camera on your bird feeding station, uh, that helps too. <laughs> but I would say, I would say, uh, with rare exception, we're out there every day. Every day, the bird seed is getting replenished. And uh, we just want to keep drawing the birds three yards, give them a place to eat, bathe, and feed. And then the, the backyard is a certified habitat, so there's also places for nesting and shelter and shade. Uh, lots of indigenous plants out there, native food. So, uh, yeah, we just, we just want to keep the birds happy, so we go out there and we pay attention. And uh, even though we do all, we still use the pillar feeder. Okay, it's uh, 30 minutes. We're going to go. Now it's time. We can go out there and take a look at the bird feeding station, and you'll see that we use the pillar feeders, even though we do that daily interaction. And I, I set that up that way to let you know you don't have to give your feeder daily ac activity. I mean, that's why it stores seed. You don't want to watch it every day. If you don't want to check on You don't have to. That's not what you have to do. But even though we do check every day, we still use the pillar feeder that doesn't require that daily maintenance. Now, let me see if I can show you guys what's going on out there right now. If we go to a tab, I should have one open here. Oh, looky there. Okay. Oh, front and center. Our friend, the morning dove, affectionately known as the Modo. That's the first two letters of the first name morning and the first two letters of the second name dove They're contracted to make modo. And if you put those, you string all those letters together in all caps, M O D O, that is the bird banding code for the morning dove. And uh, I got to tell you, I get a kick out of birds sitting right there on the front of that feeding tray, right on the bird garden, YouTube channel sticker. I get a kick out of that. Thank you. Morning dove. Uh, and that would be considered, we call that bird a pig. 
at the feeding station. They run off other birds and they gobble up as much of that food as they can. But hey, um, I mean, I don't, I don't really like to see them scare off the white crowned sparrows that are only here during the winter. But I mean, you know, they're a big bird. And when other birds see a big bird at the feeder, it's like, hey, it must be cool down there. Let's go check that out. So they're also an attractant to other birds. So very tolerable. I saw a shadow back there. And a lot of times you can look in the background behind the fence and see lots of bird activity, especially cardinals and sparrows. And just over the peak of that feeder on the left, the suet ball feeder, you see that bird bath and a camera attached to it. And that's how we got that bluebird that was bathing last spring. Two filler pe uh, pillar feeders in action there. One on the right that's uh, half gone. That's one like I just showed you. It's heat infused. So train the squirrels not to come by. They don't want that heat in their mouth. Then the one, the left pillar feeder, it's on the right side of the pole, just uh, the, at the morning doves one o'clock there. You can see that's a different mix. It's got holeless seeds, but it also has freeze dried mealworms. You see those string things? Those are mealworms, which attracts uh, the mockingbird. He loves to eat those. Robin. The woodpeckers, they'd love to eat those things too. The eastern bluebirds, man, if, if they have an option, they'll always take a mealworm. And then on the left, those suet balls are insect infused also. So there's some protein in, the, in those suet balls also. But that's what we're working with, all right? And so there's loose feed in the tray. Now, when a, uh, uh, one of these pillars, the side, you can see the side on the right. Look at the right side of the pillar feeder on the right. You see that sides all the way into the, the metal uh, stalk there. So there's a chance if the birds keep eating on that side only, uh, and there goes the morning dove. If they keep eating on that side only, that um, pillar feeder is going to fall, right? So when that happens, uh, then we, we take off the broken chunk and just set it up in the pillar feeder. And that's what you see there on the left side of the tray, not the pillar feeder, the tray feeder. So on the left side of the tray, there's a mound of seed. That's a partial uh, leftover pillar feeder, right? And then birds will just you know, pick it off from there as well. And that happens when um, the, the best bird feeder because it just has a single stalk and a rest at the bottom. Uh, if, if the birds eat half of it away, there's nothing to keep it from being knocked off. So when we see that, we rescue the remains of the pillar feeder and stick it in the tray feeder. Works perfect. Yeah. And so not a lot of bird activity right now. The morning dove left. I don't see a lot of birds moving around the back, which always makes me suspicious of the Cooper's hawk. And let me... Did someone notice the temperature? Let me go back in here where I can see. Okay, 65 degrees, is it? Or 63. I think it's 63. All right, so that's it's unseasonably warm. And what that means is we've got some bugs moving around. Not all we haven't had bugs moving around many days. Uh it's first of March. And uh so there's lots of natural food. If you see the thumbnail, I uploaded it late, so you may have came in before you saw it. It's a dried sunflower head with a chickadee on it feeding on the seeds. Natural foods, okay? If there are any natural sunflowers out there, and I had one volunteer under the bird feeder when I was feeding black gold sunflower seeds two years ago here. Volunteer, grew up beside those steps, you see. Let it do its thing. Beautiful, beautiful little flower. It died, it dried, and the birds ate it just right where it grew. So if they dropped any other sunflower seeds back there behind the fence that we can't see, and they've grown and dried, they could be back there uh, just eating some naturally grown sunflower seed and some bugs, which brings me to a very important bird feeding point. Birds are like humans. They feed instinctively. They get hungry. They eat. So if if you put out a bird feeding station and you're concerned, I just can't keep it going. I don't want to get the birds trained and then starve them. I, that That's propaganda, I think, from bird food manufacturers. If a bird gets hungry, it's going to eat. If you've got, and it's easy, 
It's right there in a safe, open space. They'll come and eat it. If it's not there, they're going to go somewhere and eat it. Maybe they'll find another feeding station, but you're not going to alter their instinct. Now, the caveat, there's always a caveat, right? In this area is the uh, the migratory rufous hummingbird that sometimes comes through in very small numbers, rarely, uh, in the winter. And he'll find a, a hummingbird feeder in the late fall and stay for that hummingbird feeder. Now, if you keep a hummingbird feeder going into the late fall and a rufous hummingbird, which they do around here, decides, and there have also been um, the common ruby-throated hummingbird. That's the one we have the most of here. That could occasionally do that, but more often it's the uh, rufous hummingbird. You've got to keep that hummingbird feeder functional. There is no natural option. <laughs> the hummingbird will get naturally hungry and he'll naturally forage. But in the wintertime here, there's no food. There's no insects. There's no nectar. It's you in that nectar feeder. So then in that case, what people do is they end up uh, changing the nectar more often or as often as it takes so that it doesn't freeze and or putting heat tape or a heat lamp on the feeder 24 seven. So it doesn't freeze. Uh, and the most important time is when the hummingbird wakes up in the morning and it's exhausted nearly all of its stores of energy, uh, just staying warm, going into a torpor and using energy to stay warm and not freeze through the night. So first call, he has got, he, she has got to get to some, uh, food source, some nectar. And if your bird, if your hummingbird feeder is frozen, uh, you just, you know, that's the demise of the bird. So there's the caveat. Otherwise, in my experience, you're not going to change, especially a healthy bird. If a bird is sick, injured, needs rehab, but can still make it to your feeder, that's different than a healthy bird. You're not going to change the instincts of a bird by offering a bird feeder. Now, there's there's some sage uh, experience speaking once again. Checking in on chat over here in the live stream. Barb D is here. Greetings from the uh, UK. Glad to know I'm loud and clear. And thank you for, for being here from the UK. I always appreciate having you here, Barb D. Okay, I did make contact. Um, that's funny that I said it that way. I want to talk about my shirt, the ivory, the uh, ivory, the pileated woodpecker for a moment. Uh, let's see. We did all the house cleaning. We got the T-shirt. Yeah, I'm looking at my show notes, the T-shirt, right? And then well, I've got to show you that, that video. I want to screen share. Oh, there's the northern mockingbird, the state bird of Tennessee, loud and proud. And where is it on the center plastic feeding cup there full of suet balls, tiny suet balls. That's a rendered fat, high energy carbohydrate and dehydrated mealworms. So the mockingbird, definitely a bug eater, definitely a protein eater, not so much interested in the seeds, uh, but the tiny suet specks and the uh, freeze dried mealworms that'll get a mockingbird at your feeder. Yeah, keeping the throat uh, hydrated. Last week it gave out. You got the uh, throat lozenge on the side here, just ready. That's that's more expert free advice right here uh, on the excellent Bird Garden YouTube channel, Bird Talk Show. Uh, if you're going to do a live stream, uh, keep a throat lozenge handy because you, if you're live and you don't have a voice, it gets awkward. You hear whispers in the chat. This is awkward. You don't want to make your guest awkward. So just, just keep your throat in good shape. Keep your voice alive while you're uh, live streaming, man, right? Okay, so the shirt. This is Pileated Woodpecker. It was the eight. Look at the bottom there. You see it was the ABA Bird of the Year in 2021. Last year's Bird of the Year, the Pileated Woodpecker. What's that nice abstract art? I see the woodpecker head. Yep, affiliated. And uh, this is a P I W O, right? So the first two letters of the first name, pileated or pileated, both are correct. And the first two letters of the second name, woodpecker, W O P I W O, uh, P W O, 
That is the banding nomenclature, the banding code for the pileated woodpecker. Now, the pileated woodpecker, uh, and this is not an ink blob. This is a tree and a bird flying out of the tree. It just doesn't show well. Uh, it's too shiny. But that's what happens when you go too far on a T-shirt. Right there would have been a great T-shirt. They went too far. Now, I'm a T-shirt expert. <laughs> you know, you know. A. Woodpecker. Giant woodpecker. It's the only woodpecker that uh, we often have uh, just off screen of the feeding station, yet never on screen. Never had one at the feeder. Seen them in several trees all across the fence roads. There's a video. You can check out the video. Got a sweet close-up video. One just landed right behind the feeding station as that Caroline Chickadee pear drops in. And preened. Oh, it's a great video. Pillie Woodpecker on the YouTube channel, Bird Garden. Check it out. So huge, huge woodpeckers, right? And they, I, I made contact, right? I want to say it that way. Hello, Nola's Dolls and Aquatics. Thanks for being here. We got burbs. Uh, I think that's slang for bird. I'm hoping so. And this uh, contact that I made, I've discovered, I discovered um, a group that is searching and researching the ivory-billed woodpecker. Now, the ivory-billed woodpecker is known in history as the Lord God bird. It's even bigger than the pileated woodpecker. Very similar. You look up a picture, that's worth a Google, ivory billed woodpecker. And there's a debate right now going on in the world of whether or not the ivory billed woodpecker is extinct. Well, I found a group that believes it is not. And they're doing field research, field hunting, field recording, I uh, was uh, invited to a Zoom, a live Zoom meeting with the group and the group leader. His name is Matt Cloudman. Very kind gentleman allowed me into the Zoom and I got to hear about some of the researchers and the searchers activities. And it was amazing. I was really impressed. And they're looking for the ivory billed woodpecker. They believe they found it. They claim contact. Uh, it's the house finches with the tufted titmouse move in right there with the Carolina chickadee right there on the bird garden feeding station. They believe they've made contact. They're talking about it. Eastern bluebird getting some of those freeze dried millworms and American goldfinch on the top. And just like that, we've got a feeding frenzy from, uh, from zero to seven birds in a hurry. Probably the hawk moved out of the area. Now these birds missed a snack. Looking for the ivory bill woodpecker, no easy task. They're searching all over the swamps of Louisiana. And I asked Mr. Cloudman if he'd be a guest on the show. And I think we're going to be able to work something out. I don't know that he'll be able to appear live. I may have to record an interview with Matt and then play it back during this time slot uh, as a pre-recorded session. I hope that's okay with you guys. Uh, but ivory billed woodpecker, man. Now, when I, I've been um, several terms, I was vice president of the Tennessee Ornithological Society. One of those terms way back in the 2000 pre-10s, I guess, maybe it was my first, first or second term, we hosted uh, Mr. Bobby Harrison at our TOS spring meeting. Big deal. Lots of people. And he claimed to have seen the ivory billed woodpecker in Arkansas, Big Woods, Arkansas, caused quite a stir. The bird we thought was extinct, boom, had a sighting. Cool. That was 2007 ish. And now here we are, 2022. And so the big deal is the big deal, and the reason Matt Cloudman's work, uh, Cortman, I'm saying Cloudman, it's Cortman. Uh, I apologize, Matt. Matt Cortman of uh, Mission Ivory Bill. You can check out the YouTube page and learn more about it. Um, Matt Cortman uh, is passionate about this Ivory Bill Woodpecker idea because the movement afoot is to have the Ivory Billed Woodpecker listed as extinct. Now, I asked Matt in that Zoom meeting, what is the benefit of declaring the Ivory Billed Woodpecker extinct? And with a very brief cursory conversation, uh, the answer is there is no benefit. Then why do we want to um, declare it extinct? And what are the consequences of declaring it extinct? So 
the, there's a minor, I say minor, that's opinion. Uh, there's a convenience element in declaring the bird extinct, but the consequences are overwhelming because currently the ivory bill woodpecker is listed as an endangered species, which gives it and its habitat significant protection. Declaring it extinct would remove that protection, and much of the ivory billed woodpecker's habitat that's also protected because the bird's listed as endangered would lose protection. There's no other species that can protect all the area that is protected because the ivory bill woodpecker is listed as an endangered species. Now, I'm not going to repeat that or explain it further. I'm going to leave that out there. Rewatch this and the replay. Tease it out. Uh, if you agree, disagree, have comments, I'd love to know what your comments are. This is not dogma. This is factual information, uh, the best I can discern and believe after research and a personal account here with uh, Mr. Matt Cortman. Give me your comment. Leave a comment right now in the chat. And definitely, if you're watching the replay, leave a comment below. We've talked about the best bird food. I showed you the best bird feeder. Now, now we're in the heavy duty territory at 48 minute mark. Is the ivory-billed woodpecker extinct? Well, we're not going to decide that today. We're not even going to talk about it much anymore. But I'm going to introduce you to the idea. And wow, what a topic we fell into between uh, episode 16 and episode 17. Hopefully, an episode coming soon, we're going to get to hear more about that from Matt Cortman, uh, who is uh, the founder of a, a mission ivory bill learn more about that and he's he's involved in in more than that also and i don't want to tell his story because i'm very hopeful based on uh, offline conversations um uh, uh exchanges of of messages with matt that we will have uh, we will have a direct interview with him coming hopefully sooner rather than later but uh, you hold me to that. Uh, you ask about him every now and then until we actually see him here on the show. Uh, Barb D says, I've looked at my bird book and the ivory bill woodpecker is not listed. As a matter of fact, my bird book uh, doesn't have the ivory bill in it either, Barb D. I have the uh, Sibley's Guide. And what I did, uh, this was, I mean, years ago, I went to the David Sibley website, perhaps it's davidsibley.com or maybe davidsibleyfieldguides.com. And he had uh, drawn the ivory billed woodpecker. He, he did a page for the book you could print out. And I did. Um, I'll save that for uh, when we talk with Matt, but I was able to go to davidsibleyfieldguides.com or the website associated with David Sibley Field Guides and print out a ivory billed woodpecker page. And he described it with all the field marks, just as he did the other woodpeckers, including the Pillier woodpecker. I folded the printed page, put it in my field guide. Yeah, so not uncommon. Uh, and many times when birds have been extirpated, extinct, or they're just not where they used to be anymore, field guides won't include them. In an Eastern field guide, if the bird's not in the East anymore, they just won't include them. They may be listed. You may read in the first of the book or the end of the book, there's a red-winged blackbird dropping in. Great having those guys around. Definitely not displaying here like he was in the, the subject of our videos that are that are posted on the bird garden channel. Yeah. So sometimes the, the revisions and the updates and the sequential additions of field guides will leave birds out intentionally and then have them in a list either at the front of the guide or the back of the guide and say, these birds formerly were listed or in the area. Now they're not. And so go to Google right? Go to Google and search ivory billed woodpecker. You will learn all of the major sites will have some attribution to the ivory billed woodpecker. You'll, you'll see the difference strikingly different than the pileated woodpecker, unless you're not that familiar with the pileated woodpecker. Now, 51 minutes in 10 people watching. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'll tell you when you have the reputation of being the bird guy in your community, right? And then in 2000, 5, 2007, word breaks and becomes national news that the ivory bill woodpecker has been rediscovered, whatever that word means. Uh, and then people start seeing this 
pileated woodpecker, you get your phone rings, you get calls you didn't get before the rediscovery of the ivory bill woodpecker. Hey, that bird's in my backyard. Hey, I got that bird on my feeder. My mom had that bird on her feeder. Hey, listen, I thank you for the call. I'm so glad you're interested in the ivory bill woodpecker. Please, please familiarize yourself with the pileated woodpecker. Okay, look it up in a bird guide, an encyclopedia, uh, internet, and then compare the pileated woodpecker to the bird you're talking about. And if you still think it's different, I want to come over there and get a picture of it. And you be sure and call me, okay? I didn't get any callbacks, right? Now, do, do I believe the ivory bill woodpecker uh, is extinct or not? I'm not going to say right now. I'm not. I want to save that for a conversation with Matt, and I definitely want to talk about it. <clears throat> wow. It's a good thing I'm not a preacher. Or maybe, maybe it would be good if I were a preacher. <laughs> Losing my voice so easily. 12 people finding their way in here. Uh, lots of activity over here in the chat. Thank you, guys. Jennifer Weaver says, we get pileated at our suet feeder every other day. Uh, I've been sitting on our deck and had them at the feeder about 12 feet away they're very skittish indeed i've had a hard time um photographing them they're so skittish and then i hear matt talk about the uh, ivory billed woodpecker and he says it's <laughs> skittish is not the right word stealthy is more like it cryptic so um canessio valley cichlid says matt cortman is fighting for the bird oh well, yeah absolutely Matt Cortman is and I salute him and support him in doing so. And, and there's a lot of side benefits beyond the bird. Uh, and hopefully again, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, not going to steal his thunder or misrepresent him. We'll just wait for him to, to speak to that. It'll be so much fun when he does. Uh, we are 53 minutes in and I promised that I would show you a video. Let's cut over to this video and I made this video just this week, uh, and it was just last week when these uh, red-winged blackbird males dropped in. Posed, not only, no, they didn't pose, they demonstrated. They postured. It was awesome. Uh, tab. Yeah, there we go. I want to show you this. I'm going to be quiet and play the video. It's two minutes. I want you to enjoy it. The music is by our friend Myrtle Singh. And I'll be back after this. Oh, I love that. So happy to share that with you. 
give me a comment uh, below. What what are your thoughts after having seen that? I have so many positive thoughts. I, that bird always, I always uh, have an an, uh, an elevated mood to say the least when I see that bird, and have since I was a child. Wonderful relationship with that bird. And I've got a morning dove cooing in the background. Uh, we I must have <laughs> accidentally uh, stumbled into a playlist there instead of just the, the single video. But I'm happy to share that with you. Dee's Fin Den, welcome. Good to see you here. Uh, yeah, I agree. Beautiful music and bird. Uh, Myrtle Singh, original composition there. And he gave me the song so I could use it for background music for videos. So thank you very much. Barb D says lots of puffery. The male red winged blackbird showing off his red shoulder pads for sure. For sure. If you read the description, there's a little bit more information about those birds. Uh, I'd say they're the, not necessarily really early migrants, but early in the sense that they're the first ones we've seen passing through the yard this spring. So yeah, see, Canessio Valley cichlids picked up on, hey, man, my first thought was a red-winged blackbird at 35 degrees. Wow, these are guys that are ahead of the curve. They're, and if you read the description, they, they got business to take care of. They're on a mission, and that's why they don't care what the thermometer says. They got, they got work. They got work. So thank you guys again for being here, for commenting. I'd like to hear what you think about that new video, the collaboration with Myrtle Singh. And uh, don't forget, there's a short video. If you like to have short videos to share on your social medias, there's one. There'll probably be another one tomorrow. We've got the one minute short up and probably a 15 second one will be produced for tomorrow. Uh, we didn't move the microphone around. We've got a little bit of adjusting, adjusting done here in the studio. Uh, you guys said the AV was good. So we'll probably leave it uh, in that configuration. Thank you very much for letting me know about that. If you like me wearing birding t-shirts during the show let me know sometimes i get you know i've got the button-up collar you know and the long sleeves and um it, it's nice to dress down it's just it's comfortable so let me know what you think you like the birding motif graphic t-shirts is that okay give me a comment i'd like to know uh get you as involved as possible uh speaking of, of involvement keep your eye on the community tab we're doing lots of work over there uh, another contact that I've made is with another YouTube channel. I'll give them a shout out now, uh, later. I hope to have them on as a guest and we'll talk more about their work, but the YouTube channel name is Badger Land, one word, Badger Land Birding, two brothers, Ryan and Derek doing great YouTube work, talking about bird watching, going all over. They've got a, uh, they've, they've devised a bracket of which is the best duck ducks are competing based on popularity votes. Uh, it's just a wonderful way to uh, elevate awareness of birds, bird watching, ducks, waterfowl, uh, ecology. I just I salute those guys. I look forward to talking to them in the future. Um, but they are optimizing their community tab with their uh, duck contest. And I was really inspired by those guys. I think it'll go a long way to build community uh, while we continue to raise awareness about birds and birding and uh, just, you know, it's it's great to be a part of BirdTube. And some of you here I, I see are part of FishTube and the Fish Fam. Well, BirdTube and the Bird Fam, so familiar. It's so similar. Uh, it's because it's nature-based. We are just, we, we humans are made complete and healed and fixed up when we connect with nature, whether it's fish or, or birds or both or sunsets. It's, it's rejuvenating. So we all have that in common. And I think uh, if we expand our buffet of options, if we're keeping fish or watching birds and we get the other on our buffet of options, oh man, the horizon this gets nicer and bigger. More to do and think about and enjoy. And more avenues to pursue happiness. I can't help it, guys. It's, it's just what's in the heart. It bubbles over. And speaking of bubbling over, I think we've we've gone over our time a few seconds today, and that's all right, but we are going to have to close today's show. I look forward to having you back here next week, same time, Wednesday, 1 o'clock. If you're not available for the live stream, we're going to upload all of the Bird Talk shows as content you can enjoy on the replay. 
Thanks everyone for your activity in the chat. Do leave me a comment on the t-shirt, the ivory billed woodpecker and your favorite bird food after this uploads as content in the comments below that video. Until the next time, why don't you get out there and see some birds?